Okay, so just wait another minute or so to see who else is joining us. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. I see the welcome screen. Okay, we're up to over 200 attendees now, so um, there's still a few coming in, but um, I think we'll make a start. So welcome to the we uh, Mapping Webinar number two. Um, some of you may have well been um, on web Mapping Webinar one, so this is a follow-on um, to, to that. So very welcome to if you've come on for the first time or this is the second part you're joining us for. Just going to move on. To, if I can move on to the next slide, okay. So my name is Rick Gamble. I'm the British Orienteering Development Officer, and with me today are the presenters uh, Martin Hoare, Simon Starkey, Ben Mitchell, and John Moody. They'll all bring you um, sort of their slant on mapping. They have lots of experience, and they'll have lots of top tips. But obviously, um, mapping is done as a sort of personal thing in a sense. Um, everyone has their own methods. So hopefully we can all gain lots um, of, of just advice and, and, and support from, from this evening, as, as we did from the last session. This is a webinar as opposed to a meeting, so um, bear with us. It is, we will present, um, so you will, participants will be muted whilst we're presenting. That doesn't mean you can't ask questions. There is a chat bar on, on the right-hand side in the control menu. Um, please use that, put any questions on that. If we're not possible, if we can't, can't possibly answer all your questions maybe in the webinar, we will follow it up in the supporting document. But after the presentations, we hope to have about 10 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers. But um, on our website, on the British Orientation website, under the webinar page, you will find um, the presentations um, and also the supporting documents along with uh, a copy of, of, of our webinar this evening, a video, a video copy of that. Also on, on the British Orientation website, you know, under the training and support section, you'll find other things on mapping, all useful um, documents on mapping. So please use, use that resource. So without too much um, further from me, I'm now going to introduce and hand over to Martin, and who will then hand over to Simon. Um, who's going to give us an overview of how to create a map using Open Orienteering Mapper. So um, I'll just um, make Martin the mapper, so bear with me one second. Thank you. Right, and that's the screen. Are we there, Rick? I think we're there, Martin. Sorry about that delay. Let me just, um, I've got to reduce the uh, the people now very substantially. And so I've got my main screen. Here we go. That's the way to do it. Right. Are we okay, Rick? You got me? Yes. Yeah, that's great. That's well, great. Um, well, <laughs> yeah, welcome everyone from me. Uh, I'm doing the first session. I'm Martin Hall from Suffolk. Uh, I'm going to do a session on uh, using templates to produce a, a base map. Um, uh, just to let you know right at the beginning, there's no need to write any notes down. Everything that I say is going to be in the notes, which will be emailed after the seminar or or on the on the web page on the seminar on the webinar web page, and it will include all the web links to uh, software that I'm. Uh, that I'm going to talk about. Um, just to let you know what I use, but this session is really designed to be appropriate for people who use um, Open Orienteering Mapper or whichever OCAD version you, you use. But I actually use Open Orienteering Mapper for cartography 
And um, uh, although the latest OCAG can process LIDAR data direct um, and efficiently, um, OOM, which I use, and earlier OCAD versions require some pre-processing in geographic information system software, and I use uh, Sargagist. But guidance on these various uh, software options will, will follow later. Um, and I'm going to look at templates from um, two sources, three sources, sorry, uh, from the Ordnance Survey and other mapping sources, uh, aerial photography, of course, and LIDAR. Uh, and I'll spend uh, quite a lot of the session on, on the LIDAR. Um, and I will cover what's available and uh, where you can get it from and how to interpret it. But I'm afraid that there isn't time in this session to cover how to process it and how to open it as a template. All that's covered in, in notes that are on the, um, uh, the British Orienteering website. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll be able to, um, to uh, point you in the right direction uh, for those. And that's the wrong slide, apologies, because I now need to go straight to my first map, which I shall do like that. And well, there's nothing on it, um, but that's purposeful because um, the first thing that you need to do is to georeference a map if you're starting a new map today. Uh, in the past, we didn't do that, but I think um, everyone agrees that that's a sensible thing to do. Um, and this map has already been georeferenced. I won't go through the details because this is just for OOM and a lot of people watching will, will be using OCAD. Um, but uh, basically the grid I've got on the screen is an Ordnance Survey grid. Um, down the bottom right-hand corner, I've got Ordnance Survey coordinates, 12 figure coordinates, and there's 100 meters between there and there. So I've got a 100 meter Ordnance Survey grid up on the screen. And I'm gonna look at various um, mapping products that we could use as our base map. This first one is from Ordnance Survey Open Data. Um, it's a free download. Uh, there are no copyright issues and it is georeferenced and you can have it in raster format, um, which basically means it's pixelated. You can see pixels um, or vector format, um, which means you could import it straight into the map. But um, for anybody who's not quite um, uh, au fait with uh, a drawing map starting out, um, let me just demonstrate on this little building here. Um, I can choose a symbol. It's going to be the building symbol. And I can choose a drawing tool. And I can quickly draw a building. And there we are. And I've drawn the first thing on my map. And in fact, if I now were to uh, get rid of that template, the building is still there. Um, I'll delete that because um, I don't really want it at the moment, but um, that's how you use a base map as a template. But this base map from Open uh, OS Open Data also comes in uh, raster format, and I'd imported that already. You can import it, sorry, in vector format. You can import it um, quite simply, and um, I imported it with these symbols which I'll just unhide. And you can see that we now have a different version of exactly the same map. But this time it's in vector format. So each symbol is already drawn on the map. Uh, and that's potentially extremely useful, of course. But unfortunately, um, this particular quality of mapping, I don't myself find uh, very helpful because there's better just an introduction as to what, uh, that, what the dis difference is between raster uh, mapping and vector templates. So I'm going to just switch that off again because it'll get in the way otherwise, just hide those symbols again. Um, the next map I'm going to show you is actually um, an, an Ordnance Survey vector map, vector map local, which you can get from the uh, government site, Magic Map. All the links are on the notes, so don't worry about those. Um, you can see already that this is considerably more detailed and um, likely to be of more use for us. And in fact, this is the one that I use as my basic Ordnance Survey background map for mapping forests. Um, this is quite good enough for uh, 1 to 10,000 and 1 to 15,000 maps. But for um, Town maps, urban maps, uh, anything at one to four thousand, including sprint maps of parks, which this will be, 
um, I actually go for the Ordnance Survey master map. Now, this is um, quite difficult to obtain. Um, you could pay a lot of money and get this in vector format. It's about um, 300 to 350 pounds per kilometer squared. So you can see why perhaps I don't do that. Now, it is possible to get it from the ProMap site um, as screenshots, but I have to merge a few screenshots together. You can see the centers of the screenshots there, which is quite tricky, but I find it worthwhile for a map like this because the detail is, is superb, as you can see. And it's usually very accurate because it's used for um, land registration purposes. It's really the gold standard, I would say, for, uh, for mapping, for more than the survey mapping. Um, so those are the maps. Um, the uh, other maps that I might show you, although I think time is gonna really preclude this, are, um, oh, I will show you one, of course. I will show you the, um, the previous orienteering map of this area. Um, and uh, this was done in 2010. And the uh, problem for this, using this map as a, a vector import, you could do it, is that you'll find it very inaccurate. I would find it very inaccurate. It wasn't georeferenced across the whole map accurately at that time. Um, it's using the wrong uh, symbol set for current sprint maps, as you can see. And uh, I tend to find this more useful to use as a template. Um, and it's not very accurate necessarily as a template. But of course, the things that the previous map are marked on it, like that grave there, are likely to still to be there. And I missed that first time round. I went back to the park and looked again. And yep, the grave's there. Not quite in that place, but without that um, prompt, I might not have found it. So the old uh, orienteering map is certainly, certainly very useful. Um, and in the future, hopefully, all our maps will be georeferenced and we will be able to bring in old maps um, as vector imports and start from the map rather than tracing over. But right now, I think most mappers uh, would start by tracing over a 10 year old map. Uh, the other two maps I, I don't think I'll bother with at the moment because time is pressing, but um, that would be the Ordnance Survey 25,000 uh, map, which is really only useful, I find, for contours if you haven't got LIDAR. If you've got no LIDAR coverage, that map will give you uh, five meter interval contours um, and uh, the last one is OpenStreetMap which people are probably familiar with. Um, OpenStreetMap is uh, actually referenced to a completely different grid to the Ordnance Survey one, the world grid um, system used by Google Earth and uh, by GPS and by MapRun so it's uh, pretty general of use but um, I don't find the OpenStreetMap particularly helpful for orienteering mapping. Some people might and you can import it directly or uh, I'll bring it in directly as a template. Let's go now to look at uh, aerial photography. Um, the go-to site for aerial photography now, uh, all the presenters today are agreed, is um, SAS Planet. It's, uh, it's Russian software. Um, it uh, merges high definition photos from Google Earth and from loads of other sources, uh, including Bing, um, it's georeferenced to this world grid system, not surprisingly, um, which means there's a conversion to do, which um, Open Orienteering Mapper and OCAD, current OCAD, will do uh, for you. Uh, it's my go-to source. But I'm also going to mention um, our environment agency, or DEFRA, Vertical Aerial Photography, which you get from the same site as LIDAR. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, it's ready reference to the Ordnance Survey grid. Uh, but there's very limited coverage and there's no coverage of the park I'm working on at the moment, uh, showing you at the moment. Um, so let's go back to the taskbar and back to that map. And I can bring in the photo and get rid of that and bring that one in. And the photos are pretty, pretty good. As you can see, it's skew. It's skew because of the um, uh, projection transformations had to take place to get it to the Ordnance Survey grid. Um, and you can see the detail. Um, you can see how closely it fits with um, the Ordnance Survey master map as well. Um, and these two together are um, a great help in, in drawing up this map. Um, this one is actually a pretty much a vertical photo. You're looking straight down on the buildings, but that isn't always the case. And just to demonstrate that, um, whoops, that's not going to work. 
just to demonstrate that, I'll go on to the next picture. This is a, um, an aerial photo from the same source, SAS Planet, but it's of um, uh, a site in Clare, a village which we're going to use for an urban stroke country park event later this year. And you can see the top of the church is way out of line with the bottom of the church, both at the back and at the front. And the reason for that is the photo was taken obliquely at an angle. And you've got to be careful with that because that it's obvious at the church, but it's also going to happen with tall trees. They'll be out of, out of alignment. And it's also possibly, possibly going to happen with um, high ground as opposed to low ground. So it's necessary to be a bit, um, a bit cautious on that with aerial photos. The other thing, of course, about aerial photos is that I'll just bring them back. And I'm going to go on to a different map now, Bridgewood, down by the River Orwell in Ipswich. Um, it's a country park, but it's totally wooded. And the other huge disadvantage of um, aerial photography, of course, is the camera can't see through the trees, uh, which brings us very neatly onto LiDAR. Now, I put this slide up because one or two people may not be familiar with how LiDAR works, perhaps quite a lot. Um, the plane flies over the terrain. It's got a GPS uh, device on board, a very accurate one, so it knows where it is, height and position. Uh, it's got a laser emitter and a laser receiver. And this um, dotted line shows from number two, um, laser light uh, going down and being reflected off the tree, the first thing it hits and heading back. And the time taken is measured, which is of course incredibly small. Um, the laser pulses are going down every meter as the plane flies or even more accurately than that. Um, oh, I've lost, sorry, I've lost my mouse. There we go. Um, looking at now at number three, you can see that the first return and the last return of the laser are identical and both give the height of the land at that point. When the plane's in position four, you've got the first return coming back from the top of the trees, the last return coming back from the ground, which is now higher, and it will measure that, and an intermediate return coming back from the bush in the middle there. And um, UK LIDAR will measure up to six intermediate returns, eight returns altogether. Um, don't think I'll show you the others. I can't get rid very easily of that thing. No, I've lost my mouse, but don't worry. Oh, here we go. Um, number one is also important because it shows what happens when you get a building in the way. Um, the software involved here is very clever and it gets rid of the building for the last return. That's called DTM or digital terrain model. So the digital terrain model measures exactly the altitude of the terrain. And the digital surface model, first return, measures the height of the first thing hit. This is where you get LIDAR from. I put England only up there because Ben told us uh, the other day that it isn't available in Wales, perhaps not in Scotland. Or Northern Ireland, so that it's a devolved responsibility. So that's um, that could be a problem. But this is the site. It's what it looks like. I've uh, um, chosen the grid square in which my map is. The chantry is in the same map as well as Bridgewood, and um, I've got all these options to choose from. Vertical aerial photography is available for Bridgewood. It's the photo I just showed. Um, but I'm going to choose the DTM and the first return DSM digital surface model, digital terrain model, and uh, work on the basis of those. Let's go for the taskbar again and move into the LIDAR, uh, and we'll go for bridge wood. Um, as I say, that's what it looks like to the camera, but this is what it looks like to the plane with the laser device, quite different. And you can see it's quite hilly. Um, and this is a, um, a raster image, um, a million pixels, 1,000 each way because it's a kilometer each way, and they're a meter grid. And it's blue for low and red for high. So it's a, it's a heat map. Um, you can change this in GIS software. I use Saga GIS um, or OCAD. Current OCAD will do it as well uh, into a slightly nicer altitude map. Again, I wouldn't use this as a template, but it very clearly demonstrates this is now um, uh, fixed intervals. Um, the altitudes are grouped in fixed intervals, 2.5 inter meter intervals. And um, yep, you can see how it generates contours, but it generates vector 
contours, which is really um, interesting. If I bring them in, they're in the map already. You can see how they work. And I've smoothed the contours. They don't quite follow the boundaries. Um, I've smoothed them so that I can bring them directly into my map. And if I get rid of the templates, you can see my contour map. And they're already on the map. Now, some people trace over, but I find these are quite good enough, generally, to bring straight into the map and then adjust. Um, also from LiDAR, you can get uh, more close interval contours. These are 0.5 meter contours. And you can now see in this valley, that most of the way around, I'm happy with the contours as they are. But I would want to change them just up here because this is a gully which the smoothing has taken out. So if I just select that one, I can um, put in a, an extra node um, probably about there and an extra node about there and one in the middle. This is very rough, of course. Oops, I've not got that quite right. Oh dear, <laughs> I've got rid of the uh, curvature on that. Let's just go back a couple of spots. There we go. And uh, I'll put one um, in the middle and hopefully this time it doesn't uh, get rid of the one that was there, that's better. And I can drag it up like that. And very roughly, I've adjusted that contour to reflect the, uh, the gully that's running down there. Um, and that's, that's really quite useful. Um, and I've done that in several places in the map, most particularly uh, down here. I haven't got time to show you the result, but you can see down in this complicated area, the uh, tighter interval contours are giving me a lot more information with which to adjust my contour lines. Okay, the next thing you get from the DTM LiDAR is a hill shade. And I've chosen a hill shade here from two angles. That one's with the sun, virtual sun, of course, uh, shining in from the northeast. And everything that would be in shadow is shown darker. Uh, and this is just the ground that's being shown. None of the trees, this is just the ground. And I can bring one in from the northwest as well, which is slightly different. Um, and that one's actually probably easier to read in this case because the ground slopes in, a, in that particular way. But these hillshade templates are really good. That, for example, is an earth bank. This is a path, not shown on the photograph or indeed on the Ordnance Survey. This is a path. That one's a ditch. Can you tell the difference? Well, you can't, but when you get out there, you'll find that that one's a path and that one's a ditch. Um, looking in this little area here, I can bring in some tight contours uh, these are very tight the contours that are coming in now and between with the two of them I can see that I've got a nice knoll there and I know exactly what shape it is though to be honest the detail of that is far too detailed for the map and I've got a pond there and you can draw the shape of the pond really really well um, obviously you've got to be careful with this that you don't put too much detail on the map it would be far too easy but I find this uh, very helpful for uh, locating exactly where some of these contour features are So that's LiDAR for contours. What about um, LiDAR for vegetation? I'm going to head back to my Chantry map and show the whole map and get rid of some of these earlier um, templates and bring in the vegetation template. And this is um, from the DSM um, LiDAR. In fact, it's from a normalized DSM where the first return values, sorry, the last return values, the ground, have been subtracted from the first return values, the tops of the trees, because otherwise the tops of the trees would register as their altitude above sea level, and now they register as their altitude above the ground. And I've been able to color it in uh, my GIST program, Saga GIST, so that it looks roughly as you expect for an orienteering map. Yellow is open terrain, and greens and blues, blues higher, are the trees at various heights. And um, you can see this doesn't suffer from um, shadows and it doesn't suffer from um, any oblique distortions because it's looking vertically down. It always suffers, of course, from the age of the, um, uh, of the, um, oh, where's my slash chantry? There it is. Um, it always suffers from the age of the picture. Um, you'll notice on the photograph that second tree has disappeared. It's been taken down because the um, photograph was more recent than the, um, than this template, than the LiDAR flight, though they were both very recent. Um, but this shows a lot of detail, hedges, um, 
uh, areas of um, uh, low vegetation and high trees. Very useful. Uh, I use that all the time. Um, and um, if I go to the Bridgewood map, um, you'll see how it looks like there. And this is a slightly differently looking uh, template, but you'll see how I can pick out vegetation boundaries. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to bring it up that fast, but you can see them now. Vegetation boundaries quite clearly, which aren't shown in the photographs. So that's really useful having those. Um, back to Chantry, because I put in just a couple more very quick um, uh, templates there, which I do use. That's an intensity template, can't go into detail, but you can see how that template, again from LIDAR, shows um, paths in open areas very well, and even paths sometimes through, through the wooded areas, because it's um, measuring the reflectivity of the ground that it hits, the laser hit. Um, an undergrowth template, which um, measures those intermediate um, uh, laser pulses. Uh, quite complicated to achieve this. Uh, it's all in the notes, so, so don't worry about that. Down here, you'll see we've got a lot of vegetation there, actually, um, round, round a copse. Just down in that area, there's a lot of vegetation which you wouldn't want to run through, and it's quite useful to have that um, on the template, uh, though the template isn't all that accurate, I have to say. Uh, the LIDAR misses a lot of vegetation. Um, I'll not bother with the last two, but they're in the notes. I think we need to round the session up very quickly now, but just go back to, um, to my PowerPoints and to further information. Um, the notes of this session, I say will be emailed. I think actually they're going to be on the website um, and that will include all web links and not just what I've said, but some of the things that I've had to miss out in order to keep the time. And they're relevant to OCAD or OOM. I've also put some detailed how-to guidance notes on uh, processing for open orienteering mapper using SAGAGIS on the uh, British Orienteering Mapping resource page. Uh, Rick referred to that page earlier. Um, version two is up now and version three, which will take on board questions and issues that have come up through this webinar series, will follow shortly, hopefully uh, in a week's time, maybe 10 days time. Uh, I'll have to check everything's accurate before it goes up. Um, there's some notes on processing using QGIS rather than SAGAGIS. Uh, John's going to talk about that uh, later, but they're also available on the same page. And of course, the latest OCAD version um, since 2018 has a comprehensive health facility, I believe. Uh, I don't have it myself, which covers most of this. And according to my um, watch, I finished at uh, 8 o'clock and 45 seconds. So that can't be too bad. Rick, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'll, whilst I'm trying to organize the get in, passed over to Simon. And I got um, some information here through from in the question box um, from Tim Harding and Tim O'Donoghue but regarding LIDAR available. It's available in Scotland, but um, they think on remote sensing site, um, but only some um, availability regards to LIDAR. And I know, I, well, I don't know, but I'm nearly sure in Northern Ireland, that water service um, ground is covered um, by LIDAR. I'm not sure how yeah. extensive that is, but that's just to get some information. So, so thanks, thanks again, Martin. I'll just pass. Um, on yes, to I'll, uh, I'll mute now, Rick, presumably. Perfect. Yes, you, you mute, and I'll get Simon on. Yeah, and I'll see if I can get back to the. Have we got Simon? Okay. Super. See your screen now, Simon. Right. Um, this is just a, answering a question that a lot of people say, what tool should I use, OCAD or um, Open Orienteering Mapper? Uh, what, what can I get from each? Um, they're both fully functional tools. And to a certain extent, a lot of it is down to personal choice, personal experience. So what I'm doing here is sharing the experience of the LEI Club, uh, Leicestershire. We've been using Open Orienteering Mapper as our primary tool for the last nine years, and it's a full capability tool. It's enabled us to do everything from a level D event, quick map put together, right through to a full national level A event. Uh, those of you who were at the British Sprints at Loughborough would have had a 
the maps were all prepared on Open Orienteering Mapper. So it's a tool that anyone that delivers a full function. Why should you use it? So first thing is open source mapping. That means it uses the, the team who work on it and mostly volunteers. They put together and they put the stuff up for anyone to use. It's free to use. They use libraries which are shared, but because it's free, doesn't mean it's not very good. One thing that we do do as a club is we support the open orienteering map per group. We send them a donation because is it, we, we've got a huge benefit from them. We need to support them. We need to help them. They've got their own costs, server costs, etc. We keep helping with that. The big plus point, one plus point we see of the Open Orienteering Mapper is because it's free to use, anyone can download it. It's easy to get no new mappers on board. We just say, here's a link, download it, try it. And people immediately get that feeling of what the, the full tool, they can start to learn. You know, our experience is we get less complaints and less calls for help actually from this tool, but people can then use it. Okay, not everyone goes on to become a fully fledged mapper, but we do, you know, spread, spread, spread the joy, shall we say. And if you're that way inclined, you can join the development team. Um, they're based over in Europe, but they always take inputs. And if you, you go on to the, um, GIS and uh, sorry, the uh, GitHub, so you can find out what they're working on and help them. Big plus, it's cross platform. So, Windows, Linux, Mac or OS, or even Android, whatever your preferred operating system, it will work on it. The fact it works on Android is very useful because it means you can pop it on a tablet, take it down the forest, and you've got the map open in front of you. You've got, G, uh, you've got GPS crosshairs actually on the map in front of you, and you can actually make notes in real time on top of the map. Bring them home, load them up onto your mapper, and then in your comfort, get it mapped properly. It's quite nice actually when you get the GPS hairs on the map, it actually gives you the, uh, there's a circle showing how much dither you've got. So you know how, how good a signal you're getting from the GPS. There's strict adherence to the uh, mapping standards. You get the standard symbol sets. They're all drawn correctly. OK, uh, BOF have got their own versions of them, which you can down download off the mapping resource page. But the fact that the mapping groups, the IOF, work closely with Open Orienteering Mapper does mean that adherence. It's easy to use. You saw Martin there quickly drag and drop. You've got, you need a decent three, by, three button mouse for optimum results, but it's, everything is on the, on the mouse. You've got a little, a nice little local keyboard so you don't have to keep popping to the top of the screen to the to the menu bar as your lines are moved you see the decorations move in live you don't have to you can as you drag a say a fence you can see the tags move all very intuitive all very useful i mentioned the twig toolbar already um it reads and imports ocad files directly so if some of your team are working in OCAD, you get um, input from OCAD from other people in the uh, organization. You can bring them straight into OOM. It makes a pretty good job of converting. You've then got that uh, map on your screen. You can then edit it and move on. It doesn't have a planning function like um, OCAD. It never intended to. It works directly with Purple Pen, <coughs> another open source tool. The maps go straight in. Plans can use it. It works very well for us. 
yes, there are minor issues, as with any software package. Coming back from the feedback from the mapping team at Leicester, we some have got problems with occasionally with deletion of holes. Some mutter about the fact sometimes the symbol that's selected isn't clearly indicated and they can't see the little square in the symbol table. Yes, Martin's nodding there. Um, but there's a clear method of raising queries. For example, at the beginning of the lockdown, I got in touch with them and I said, come on guys, we're all using map run, we're locked down. Um, how come OOM can't uh, export the KMZ files? Uh, version 0.95 of OOM was released a couple of weeks back. KMZ files are now supported. They listen and they're very, very reactive. Um, they're typically two updates a year, fairly substantial. Um, occasionally there's a, a howl because Purple Pen haven't quite kept, kept in step with what OOM are doing and one won't read the other for a week, but it all gets resolved pretty quickly. So certainly from the LEI uh, club, I would say we've had uh, a pretty good experience. It's been uh, a valuable, we find it a very powerful, easy to use tool. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, so thank you again. I'm just going to bring up a point actually, which was made in one of, one of the questions. Um, it's come up by Hen from Henry here. Um, you mentioned there about Purple Pen being used for planning in OOM. So is, is that, am I right in saying that Condes requires the map to be in OCAD? But maybe that's a question which Ben will be able to answer because um, Ben's our next presenter who, who is the hmm. OCAD expert. But is that, is that correct? Um, the Condis people, we, we generally just uh, do an export from OOM in an OCAD format. It will do the OCAD export. So we keep Condis people happy, but within our club, we just use Purple Pen. So I'm just going to try to swap the presenter now over to Ben. Ben, if you're ready, I'll maybe take a second or so to get over to you. Thanks again, Simon. Over to you, Ben. Super, thank you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Ben Mitchell, and I'm, I've been mapping for eight years. And I last year, I became the OCAD reseller for the UK. And OCAD is pretty much an all-in-one solution. So you can, if you, uh, you can generate LiDAR-based maps, you can plan courses, you can draw maps, and you don't need it to use any external tools to, to do all of that. And it's really quick and simple. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to really quickly run through setting up a georeference map from scratch in the newest version of OCAD orienteering. So with OCAD up, up and running, we just go to file a new, new map. We select the symbol set, which you can download to British orienteering website. And personally, I use the, if we're going to make a forest map, then it's best to stick with 1 to 15,000 as the specifications are drawn with those symbol measurements. So it's much easier to follow the guide if you if you use the correct scale, scale when you're drawing. So we'll start a new map there. So I've already, to, to speed up the time a bit, I've already downloaded the LiDAR files from the Welsh Government website. And if we go to DEM, which is the Digital Elevation Model, tab up here we can just import use this import wizard to add the data i'll just quickly find that data that i downloaded so first we'll load in the terrain model files so we just select these open them up click next and we'll just store this file as the dtm Term file. All right, now, now OCAD gives us the options to create contour lines, create create this map that Martin showed us earlier, which shows a general overview of the height of the area. Um, we can get rid of that for now. We can also create hill shading, slope gradient maps, and we can even ex extract features. So, like if a contour is a meter high, for example, for, ex for example, you could get OCAD to pinpoint where knolls are and things that show up like that. But we'll leave that for now and just just do this quickly. 
fingers crossed it'll be nice and nice and quick. So there's different ways of doing generating the contours. My preference would be to just create one meter raw contours and get OCAD to create us some smooth contours, which we can use as a guide afterwards. And we can we can generate default um, symbols for these contours, which which aren't part of the main symbol spec, but we can use them as drafts. Um, we can also show use different symbols to to show depressions, which is really handy if you're mapping somewhere with where it's if you if you're out in the field and you you can get quite confused if you just have a load of contours and no taglines. Well, OCA can show you which ones of these are depressions by coloring them in a different color. Um, this is the hill, sh hill shading. We'll get. We'll just stick with the defaults for now and just show you how quick this this is done. So uh, it's just processing millions of points. And as this data was already geo-referenced, the map becomes geo-referenced instantly as well. Because OCAD can recognize the files referencing system. I thought this might happen. <laughs> My computer's not enjoying doing the webinar at the same time. Right, here we go. So here's our geo-reference map. So it's an area of sand dunes in South Wales, and you can straight away see how clear those depressions show up, and and all the other and the base map behind, which is the slope map. So all the maps you can turn on and off, just like Martin was showing. Um, what else? Then? Yeah. So if we go to map set scale and coordinate system you can see that this is all set up now to the british national national grid so any any other geo reference material you have and you want to load into this map you can just do that by going to background map opening up so i've got some aerial photos so you can just load these in straight away and then these are all very large files so Here we go. So th there we have it. It's pretty much all you need for an, for an open area is aerial data and LIDAR. You don't really need um, OS data on top of that. Um, one other feature that OCAD does have is you can, for example, let's say we were struggling to see a fence line, although we can on this one, but I'm just, just, just let's just pretend we can't see this fence line down here. If we go to background map, online map services here, OCAD's able to to draw in, to load in a Google map satellite of the same area. So if you zoom into this, if you zoom into the same area, into an area where you might be struggling to see, or you, you can even load in the whole, the whole area of the map, but I'll just do a small area because it might take some time. So we can save that here. So there is that piece loaded in as well. So yeah, it's just OCAD is just really, really useful for setting up base maps. That's one of the main benefits is the ability to just do everything all in one without having to, to learn any external tools. So yeah, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully that's helped. If anyone has any questions at OCAD related, I'm more than happy to answer any, any via email as well. Super, thank you, Ben. I've got more. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. So, um, just no, thanks very much again, Ben. Um, there will probably be more questions towards the end. I've got some information, further information, probably regarding LIDAR. Well, I've got a question from Henry Martin regarding um, is LIDAR available primarily in flood risk land um, or is it wider spread than that? I've got, I've got basically, all, can you still see my screen? Yes. So these links here, which I'll, I'll send out afterwards, are the links for the LIDAR in Perfect. the different countries. And on these websites, you can you can view previews of of the where the data is available. So I'll just open the, the Welsh one because I know I'm used to using it. Um, so 
obviously LiDAR comes in different resolutions as well. So you can see pretty much the entire of Wales is covered. But generally speaking, they, they were for the areas first to appear would have been the flood risk areas. There's yeah. still areas of a lot of the time, the upland areas, which can be quite nice for orienteering are missing certain patches. Yeah. I know David David Gray said the LiDAR data for Scotland can be requested from the Scottish Orienteering Association as well. So I'll uh, it's Martin here. I can answer for England, I think. Is that okay, Rick? Yes, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, national LIDAR program is, is I think, the, the best LIDAR for England. Um, and the aim is to do the whole country by the end of 2021. Uh, um, John, I know, hasn't found its reach Cornwall yet, um, but it's, um, it, it's coming. Um, there is an alternative LIDAR for England, um, composite DSM and DTM, which I think is available for the whole country. No, I did mention the coastal areas, and that's the only areas that are, have got the uh, DEFRA vertical photography. Um, it's very, very limited. But as far as LIDAR is concerned, no, I think within a very short period of time, we will all have the same national program LIDAR in England. Lovely. Thank you. So, Ben, are you happy for me to hand over to John now? I'll just make John. Yeah, that's fine. The, super. I'll just make John the presenter now. Okay. That should be you now, John. Is that working? Is it working okay, Rick? Yep, people can see it, okay. So I'm really not going to say a vast amount. Um, we've had two people who use Open Orienteering, open orienteering Mapper, and we've had Ben who's told you about the, the most up-to-date version of uh, OCAD. I actually use a relatively old version of OCAD, OCAD 11, um, and I use that along with LiDAR. And I find that OCAD 11, although it was um, developed about the time when LiDAR was coming in for use for orienteering maps, I find that OCAD 11 is very slow and limited. Um, so I've actually switched over to using uh, a geographical information system, QGIS, and I process uh, the LiDAR information in QGIS and then import the information into OCAD 11. And I guess there'll be some people who are listening to this who are in the same situation, have got an old version of OCAD and still want to be able to use LiDAR. Um, the advantage of using QGIS compared to the OCAD 11 is that the uh, QGIS is much wider ranging in what it can do with the LiDAR than uh, OCAD 11. Obviously, the newer versions of OCAD can do way more than OCAD 11. Um, it's also very fast, and um, QGIS is, is freeware. Um, so you can download it for free. It's an academic uh, software package. I don't use the the current version. Uh, it changes all the time. I, uh, I use QGIS 2.18. There's a new version which has got a completely different user interface that's uh, available now, and I haven't got around to, to working out how to use that. Um, I use the QGIS for um, several purposes. One, to get primary contours. Uh, two, like Martin was explaining, to get additional contours to help you interpret the primary contours uh, to make sure that what you're seeing in the primary contours is something that's real. And I also use the QGIS to generate hillshade images, which Martin talked about. Uh, and recently, I've used those hillshade images to uh, geo-reference old maps using the, the rubber sheeting function that's also within OCAD. So I kind of work with uh, both software packages uh, together. Um, what I was going to do, and I'm hoping it's going to work, is um, just demonstrate sort of quickly uh, in QGIS uh, the sort of thing I might do. Um, you're just talking about sources of LiDAR data. Um, in my experience in, in Cornwall, the LiDAR um, coverage from the Environment Agency is patchy. Uh, it's okay on the lower ground, but it's very patchy on the, uh, the, the moorland, which we're particularly interested in. So fortunately, in, in the Southwest, we've got uh, another source of LiDAR, which is called the TELUS Southwest Project, uh, which covers everything uh, west of Exeter. So Devon, most of Devon and the whole of Cornwall is covered. And it comes in five kilometer square grids. Uh, so this is uh, an example of some raster data, uh, which Martin was talking about earlier. 
um, but this is a five by five kilometer square. Um, and I was going to just show you um, um, uh, uh, a little bit of this. This is a, a map of an area called Craddock Moor, which is a, a bit of moorland on Bodmin Moor. And I'll just show you, uh, this is the old map, just show you how I would generate uh, templates using QGIS from, from the LiDAR data. So if you look in this little bit here, if you can see my cursor, uh, this is the same little bit of the, of the map I've just shown you in the in OCAD, uh, the old map. And uh, you can't really see an awful lot on the, uh, the, the basic LiDAR data. You can see the, the valleys and you can see the hills, but it's not a great deal of use. Um, what a lot of you will find is if you have data sets that are five kilometers by five kilometers square, uh, it will tax most computers if you try and process the entire thing. So one of the first things I might do with QGIS is to clip out the piece that I'm interested in. So I would go up to uh, raster and I'd use the clipper, which allows you to crop. Um, so I'm going to select a little chunk here and I'm going to save it. Bear with me a second. Uh, so, yeah, so say over. Okay, okay. And if we close that and we switch off the original, oops, then we can zoom in. And if you remember on the OCAD image, there's a quarry at the top here. It's called the Cheese Ring Quarry. And uh, that's the Cheese Ring Quarry with all of the finger dumps there. And so you still can't see an awful lot. Uh, what I would do then is extract the, the contours. So I go to the same place, the raster menu, and use contour. And I will select a, a folder to put them into. And uh, you can do, uh, typically, I would. Uh, work on five meter contours, so I might extract 2.5 meter contours for actual use as a template for, for drawing the contours. But you can also generate quite easily uh, as little as 0.1 meter contours. I'll, I'll do one meter ones here. And it doesn't take very long, hopefully. Uh, this is typical. When you practice it, I know what it's doing, so bear with me a second. That's because I haven't removed the original. Try that again. Right, let's do that again. Sorry. Right, we'll try it again. There you go. So we can switch off the background. You can see that the contour is there, um, quarry quite clearly. And uh, that you can then export. Uh, so what I would normally do is export that as a DXF file. And we'll put it in here, we'll write this one. Okay, and then I can bring that into OCAD. So I've already opened a blank map, and I'll bring in, import the DXF file with the concerts. I'll not worry about the um, georeferencing just yet. So there you can see the concerts that I've bought in. Uh, let's let me get that out of the way. Oops. Uh, Okay, if I then um, select all, and then I'll just change that to something a bit easier to see. So you can see all the concerts there now in OCAD. Now that is sort of georeferenced at this point. Uh, what I would have to do is check that the, the grid system is correct, the coordinate system is correct. So I then just choose the right coordinate system. Um, Uh, choose the British National Grid, and that's now georeferenced. Um, so I could then save that and use that as a, a, a template uh, in the same way as, as Ben's explained. 
uh, and Martin has explained for um, current OCAD and the open orienteering mapper. Um, so the other thing I would tend to do um, uh, in uh, QGIS, if I just remove these, I'm used to working mainly with uh, open areas, open moorland, and so I tend to work with the DSM data because it can show isolated trees and gorse and that sort of thing. Um, so if I load the uh, DS, DSM data, which is the first return data that Martin explained, uh, I also can then generate hillshade images. So again, this is a five kilometer by five kilometer square. And I'll generate some hillshade on that, and just to show you how fast it can process, QGIS can process um, a block of data uh, like that. Um, it's a vast amount of data. Um, there you go. Um, we can zoom in. So I haven't bothered clipping in that case because it can process the whole lot. So again, you can see the, the cheese ring quarry. Uh, if we flick back to the original map, uh, you can see that that's the same quarry and the various mine workings that are in the foreground there. So I basically use QGIS to, to generate my primary contours. Um, I then generate contours at much much closer interval, which particularly in areas like this allows you to interpret things a bit better. Uh, you can see there are vast numbers of pits in the ground, hundreds of thousands of pits, and uh, the closer contour intervals can give you a bit more inter um, information, just like Martin explained, to help you spot uh, shallow uh, gullies. That's a shallow gully there. There's another gully there. Uh, there's a mine shaft there, uh, various places on it, so you can get all the detail. Um, you can export these hillshade images um, directly from QGIS. Uh, you simply export the image hillshade image as a JPEG, and you can bring it in behind um, uh, the uh, as a background map in OCAD, and it will be geo-referenced in the same way as the contours, so it will fit in straight behind your, your, your contours. You don't have to do any further aligning or anything like that on it. So although you have to use a separate package, a separate uh, GIS package alongside OCAD, uh, it's relatively straightforward to bring the information into OCAD. It's not as neat as the, the new versions of OCAD, which Ben has been explaining, but it, it's still perfectly possible to do it. Uh, again, I guess it's not as neat as Open Orienteering Mapper, um, but you, as I say, you can still do it. Um, I, I think I'll stop there. The other thing that I could have talked about briefly, uh, which I've been recently experimenting with, is rubber sheeting uh, old orienteering maps to use uh, as templates um, for drawing new maps, but also uh, to rubber sheet old maps for use for virtual orienteering courses. Um, but I don't think we have time to talk about that. Okay. Thank you very much, John, and the rest of the panelists. Oh, got a bit of feedback there. Um, just a few more questions coming in here. So that's, we're, we're, that's our four presentations over. Um, I'm sure we've got so much from that, maybe too much. As you know, if you get four mappers in a room, they're going to have four different ways of doing things, um, and they'll enjoy doing them their, their own way, and that's absolutely fine. What I suggest um, people do is they, they, you know, they look back at this webinar or, um, and they look at there's going to be lots of stuff on online available for people to use and look up. Um, also, the most probably the most important thing is to get in contact with your um, club mapper, get alongside them and see if they will be able to mentor you. Um, and they will have their own way of doing things. You'll be able to adopt their ways of doing things, but also your own your own ways. Um, so before before we finish up completely, I've got a few questions. Um, hopefully, the panelists will be able to answer answer these questions. If not, I say we'll get back to you. Um, the first one probably I'll direct towards Ben, if that's okay, Ben. It's from Andrew Evans. Uh, many do not have the latest version of OCAD. Is there a comparison of functions across all versions of OCAD? Yep, that's on online. I can. Shall I put it in the chat? Can I do that? 
Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes, you can put it in the chat, or we can send it after the. <laughs> sorry, there's horrible feedback. Um, thank you very much, Ben. We got that sorted. Uh, also, another question here for uh, for all of you. Does the panel have any advice on a good GPS device that works at least okay in the trees, um, but well if possible? That's from Lindsay. I don't, I don't use one myself, but I've heard that a Garmin GLO is okay. What about any of the rest of you? you might be on mute. Yes, I've, um, I've only recently. Can you hear me, uh, Rick Martin? Here, um, yes, I've only recently uh, started using GPS actually, um, uh, and I'm just using. Um, <laughs> to be honest, what I'm using, I'm using the map run facility. Um, I'm, I'm producing a KMZ version of the map and going out with that. Um, uh, obviously, the uh, GPS on my phone is pretty poor, but it, it does help. I can't rely on it, but it gives me a fair bit of um, feedback, some useful information. But I'd be very interested in who's using a really good GPS and which one. Sorry, I missed all that because the uh, internet went strange. You all became Daleks for about a minute. Sorry, no. John. The, the question you, the question was a GPS um, device that works okay and under trees, under tree cover. I use a I've got a Garmin watch which uses GPS and Galileo um, together, so you do get slightly better tracks under trees, but uh, it can jump by several meters. Um, so you have to do multiple tracks, in my experience, if you want to be, get a reliable a reliable track. Um, eventually, if you do it a few times on different days, you'll get a reliable, a reliable track. But that's what I use. Thank you. Um, I think I've got one last question here. Um, what are the main differences between British orienteering symbol sets and international ones? Uh, there are none. Um, Officially, yeah, there are additional. Officially, there are none, but uh, th there are some slight tweaks that Boff have made just to, to uh, because the international sets were drawn up for sort of Swedish woodland, and there's some issues around uh, the depiction of water. So, as I say, you can use the the, the IOF set or you can use the Boff set. That's great, thank you. Um, apologies if I've missed some questions, but I, I will go through the questions at, after the webinar. And mm -hmm. as I said, we'll produce, we'll produce a, a list of the answers for those. Um, I'll draw the session to a close then. And thank you very much, Martin, Simon, Ben, and John for your time and the preparation and, and delivery of the mapping webinar. Um, I'm sure we've all learned lots from that um, and hopefully better equipped now to go out and start start planning, start mapping. Um, so, yes. Martin, um, I don't know if we've got a moment. I think we might have just a couple of moments. I, yes, I, something. I think it might be quite interesting for people. It's on my screen now, which is the actual base map that I take out into the field after I've got all the information off the LIDAR. Brilliant. Yeah, we've still got a few minutes left. I said we'd finish at quarter to nine. So if you want, I'll share your screen now, Martin. Sorry? I'll make you presenter now. Yeah. Is that you? Yeah, can you see me now? Yes. You got my screen? screen? Yes, we can see your screen. That's yeah. brilliant. Thank you. Oh, well, this is the Chantry map that I was working with all the time. Um, I've actually finished, well, this is well, some while ago, I actually finished drawing up. Um, uh, at least as sort of second best, um, that top bit there. But if you look at what I do, every every mapper will do differently. But I've already drawn in all the things that I'm fairly confident about um, from the uh, from the LIDAR and from the Ordnance Survey mapping and the photo. And then with these sort of uh, small black lines, thin lines, I've um, just put in things I can see on perhaps one uh, LIDAR or one photo that I'm not sure about, but I'll go out and check what's there. And the green lines are around the, the vegetation features that I've saw 
So I've got quite a lot to go out there with um, uh, when I go out into the field. Now, I'm sure everybody will do this differently. And I think Simon was saying he takes a, a tablet out into the field, which is uh, something I really want to look at as well, because that might uh, uh, speed things up considerably. But this is the sort of amount of information that I'm getting off from those templates before I actually go out into the, uh, into the park at all. That's, that's me finished on that one. Lovely, thank you, Martin. Does any of the rest of the presenters want to say any final words? Or are you happy enough? I'd like to bring people's attention to um, OCAD's YouTube channel. So if anyone's completely new to OCAD and wants to look how to draw and you know use it effectively, then that's a really good resource. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so as I was saying, there's lots of material out there um, at the OCAD YouTube channel for you to, to get deeper into it. And uh, as I said, the best way is to have somebody alongside you to mentor you. So please get in touch with your, your mapping officer at, at your club. So thanks again for the panelists for um, giving us so much information there. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, and for your, especially those people who ask questions and also give suggestions um, as we went along there. So um, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your evening. Hopefully there'll be lots of new maps. Okay, take care. Bye-bye now.